वीर प्राण धना है जय राम जय गांधर्वी का गिरी धारी गांधर्वी का गिरी धारी राम सरस्वती प्राण धना है जय गांधर्वी का गिरी धारी गांधर्वी का गिरी धारी राम जय सहगनाथन्वीव साधैत सवधूत परीजना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पदा सहगणा ललिता श्री विशाखान्विता नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण प्रेष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नितिना नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशिणे ृष्णचैतन्याभूनिंदीय हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम राम हरे 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 कृष्णा वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू एवरीबडी सो टुडे अवर टॉपिक इज डीटी वर्शिप सो दिस टॉपिक इज बेसिकली ओशियानिक as we have just seen uh, the beautiful deities of various acharyas the story of each of the deities in itself is a big session so there is no beginning no end to this beautiful topic of deity worship and it's very dear to my heart i really love <clears throat> so i will share concisely keeping in view <clears throat> uh so there are basically five potent forms of devotional service these five are stated in the chaitanya charitamrita and each of the, these five are so potent that performing each of these even to a small extent have the immense power to awaken krishna prema within our hearts that is why they are called potent really powerful forms so what are these five i will tell you an easy way to remember deity devotee naam dham and bhagwat what are they deity is deity worship archanam devotee devotees association sadhu sangha naam hari naam or the holy name dham or mathura vas which is visiting a dham and fifth is bhagwat shrimad bhagwatam these five very powerful so our entire uh, series is going to be about this topic which i am going to touch upon and expand in a particular dimension okay so today our concept of deity worship i will talk about it in three different sections first section we will deal with starting from what is the prevalent ideology about deity worship 
how is deity worship different from idolatry? How it is different from idol worship, which is so much condemned in the West and so much made fun of, or as, uh, as if something that is sentimental within India, why it has become so. So that will be our first uh, section. Then later on, we will proceed to the different acharyas and the amazing deity forms they have worshipped. What is the example they have left behind? We will discuss about that. And the third leg, the third portion of, this, of the class, I will uh, explain you a beginner's guide to deity worship. That is, most of you all are students. So right away, what you can start with, some practical tips and procedures in three, four steps, I will explain you. Okay, so we will start our session with the first aspect as to what is a prevalent ideology about deity worship and how it is right or wrong. So, <clears throat> yeah. So we, uh, we are all, most of us here, I think 98% of us here are students. So history of our education, how there are certain people within the precincts of education who have made deity worship into idolatry. And this is one of the letters that has been written by Macaulay. Yeah, and uh, who systematically wanted to break down the spiritual culture of India. And he did so with a very systematic plan. And one of his very uh, target is how to shift the attention of the Indians. This is pre-independence era. If you see, the letter is written, written on 12th October 1836, when the Britishers were trying to actually uh, capture India and actually break its uh, spiritual culture. So one of the major targets that they had uh, chosen is to how to make the Indians lose faith in their own traditions and culture, especially on in deity worship. So this is what here he writes. It is my firm belief. It's about the seventh line. It is my firm belief that if our plans of education are followed up, there will not be a single idolater among the respectable classes in Bengal 30 years hence. So the kind of education that they gave, gave us, which we are following till date, one of the projected outcome is that people lose their faith in deity worship. And he said in 30 years, they will do that. So one of the product of uh, the Western education is that more and more um, of the uh, students who are a product of this education will tend to look at deity worship as some kind of sentiment or some kind of a belief. Yeah. So how is idol worship different from DT worship? So idol worship generally, these days, if you go and see outside, there are two extremes. One, one extreme is that people say, have no faith in DT worship. And other extreme, they take up anything and start worshiping as God. The most you know, common notion is, you know, especially people who Our great false staunch followers are of cricket. They say cricket is my religion and Sachin is our God. So it's a famous saying. So everybody, each of us have a tendency to worship someone. Like I have my, some of my cousins, they're really so fascinated about a particular hero that they have their posters all over in their room. Yeah. You know, they, they have to only offer incense and flowers, that's it. If not, the kind of adoration they have for these heroes is enormous. Yeah, and, uh, if I remember that these cousins of mine, if they have to watch the movie on the first day, they used to ensure they, used to, they wake up early in the morning, wash their hair <laughs> with nice soap nuts and go fresh to the movie theater. As if, you know, if we go to temple, how we go with fresh, with washed hair and hair nicely shampooed and with fresh clothes. This is how they used to go on the first day for the movie. So basically, this is the deep-rooted tendency in each of our hearts that we want to worship someone. That propensity is there. So most of the times, especially in the modern days, it is directed towards people, hero worship. Yeah, they worship heroes or heroines or cricketers or 
movie star, movie stars of you know different and especially pop stars rock music singers and uh, what not i mean when i was a student most of my friends used to have all these backstreet boys and boys on you know big big posters stuck in their rooms they literally used to <laughs> worship them <laughs> yeah so this tendency to worship someone is so deep rooted and inherent in each of us so is this uh, how is this then different from ideal worship which is deity worship <clears throat> so there's something called symbolism yeah symbolism so again of two types it's called ascending symbolism and descending symbolism symbolism means something that symbolizes like for example if you see the flag of india flag of india what is the moment you see it what happens you 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 have a gush of patriotism yeah because the flag represents <clears throat> the nation the country so it's symbol it's symbolic of the nation but it's not the nation in itself it symbolizes the nation yeah it's abstract form so i mean as soon as you see it it, it stirs in some emotion in us you yeah? patriotic feelings in us so it's a representation of an emotion or a mental image so this is called symbolism there's also another form of symbolism wherein it's uh, it's a direct depiction of the person like uh, the um, statue of mahatma gandhi especially in front of the parliament we see the statue of mahatma gandhi sitting there yeah or recently there has been an installation of a huge statue of sardar vallabh vallabhbhai patel ji yeah so these are all the statues so these are also symbolism because that statue symbolizes the person gandhi but he is not gandhi himself right so that's what is called symbolism so uh so this is what is symbolism is ascending and descending symbolism and how is this different from dt so dt is not symbolism the of uh, whom you are seeing right in front of our eyes the dt's it's not that they symbolize god they are god and goddess themselves present right in front of our eyes chaitanya charitamrit says tumi murti nahi tumi sakshat brajendra nandan yeah you are not a dt i mean you're not some murti or idol in front of my eyes you are sakshat you are the very person krishna himself in front of my eyes that is the identity of the dt it's not that symbolizes something he is krishna himself the person krishna himself who out of who out of his mercy has chosen to descend in that particular form and this form is not the imagination of somebody like for example the flag of india or mahatma gandhi ji it's just modeled in by you know, just see the photograph and you model it according in accordance with your own understanding of how, how he might have looked like or the dimensions are your own understanding yeah so these are your own concoctions sometimes of course you know uh, if you known this 10 commandments during that time um <clears throat> people have tried to worship different i mean actually why in the west idol worship is uh, so much hated because it's uh, it's written in one of the 10 commandments that you're not supposed to worship idols so i this idol that they are speaking about is the mental concoction of people's mind just create something out of your own mind make a figure or figurine or statue out of it and start worshiping it as god so that's what is not oh, it, it yields no result yeah and in fact it's an offense but what is dt worship in in reality so dt worship in reality is its authentic form of worship it gives so many details about with what material that the dt has to be made how the different features have to be brought out and very scientific and subtle details of how the form should be everything is written in detail and the shilpakars the, the, the people who are carving these dts they're all actually come in parampara they're also trained from generations and generations and they um, it's something called shilpa shastra yeah according to that they follow these uh, guidelines and that's how they carve the dt it's very authentic and after having carved the dts according to these injunctions that are given in the shilpa shastras the next thing that happens is there are bona fide acharyas or gurus or spiritual eminent leaders who are so qualified that through their prayers and through the recitation of auspicious mantras that are given in various books 
like the Narada Panchara Travidis, <clears throat> they invoke the presence of the Supreme Lord by the power of their own devotion and their own prayers and their own training and the mercy they have received from Parampara. So they have that power to invoke the presence of the Lord. And the Lord, because it is bona fide and it is given in the scriptures, and scriptures are not different from Krishna, the Supreme Lord mercifully accepts to descend into this deity form. And then this idol or statue becomes deity, archa vidraha, vidraha, which is non different from the Supreme Lord Krishna himself. So this deity now, how it is different from uh, another normal idol? So, I mean, if you go outside to different shops, yeah, there are so many marble shops where there, there are a lot of marble deities of Krishna. Yeah, marble idols or statues of Krishna. How are they different from those that are there in the temple and worshipped? So Prabhupada gives a beautiful analogy that <clears throat> if you see earlier when in the good old days, when we used to exchange letters through post there used to be post boxes outside the houses uh, if you remember they're exactly like the post boxes that are there yeah so these post boxes outside the house outside the gate that we keep generally whenever the postman comes if we have a letter he, he just puts into that right and it looks exactly like the original post box but if you want to send if you want to send a letter to a particular destination you actually have to go travel to the authentic post box, yeah, which is certified by the Postal Department of India, and then put your letter there. Only then the letter will reach its destination. If you put into this box, which is outside our house, it doesn't reach the destination because it has not been authorized and certified by the Postal Department of India. Exactly the difference between these two is the idol and the deity. Yeah? So idol is like, you know, externally, you see the, 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 it's it's very much similar to the deity that we see in the temple. But, you know, do our prayers reach the Lord through this? No, not necessarily, because it is, uh, it's not installed technically. Yeah. So that's the difference between uh, the normal idol and the deity. So deity is Krishna himself who has descended out of his mercy. So, so why is that Krishna has descended out of his mercy? It's because, yeah. So I will give you some more details. In the Sri Vaishnava Sampradayas, okay, before that we will go to this. <clears throat> so there is an argument saying that God is present everywhere. Then why is it that we have to worship only in his deity form? So, the simple analogy is, you see a cow, right? So milk is present all over in different forms of limbs or, uh, you know, in different tissue fluids, uh, in different kind of uh, configuration. But then if you want to milk, how do you get it? And from where do you get it? You have to reach out to the udder. And there's a process how to milk the cows. I don't know if any of you have tried. It's a good thing to try. Try to milk a cow. It's not so easy. It gives one kick. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of relationship for the cow to allow you to touch its udder. So, so milk is present all over the cow, but then how do you access it? It's a process. Go to the udder and then milk. Only then you get the milk. Similarly, moisture is present everywhere. But if you want water, there's a process by which the mo moisture you know, becomes water and then finally you open the tap and then it is accessible to you as water that you can fill and use. So is with Supreme Lord Krishna. He is present everywhere. But if you want to access him, approach him, serve him, and make some exchanges with him, he descends in the form of the DT to enable you, to give you the ability to offer exchange and uh, to render some seva. So uh, another argument that is commonly present is matter is generally impure, right? Anything that is material is impure. But then such matter, can it represent God? Because the deity worship uh, is carried out in, in the authenticized uh, materials into which deities can descend are uh, stone, wood, <clears throat> paint, and pa paper, and one more. Yeah, I don't think uh, I forget that. 
So there's a, there's a five forms into which the DT or in, into which the DT can be carved and uh, the Lord can be invoked. So can these matter, which is considered impure, can they represent God? So cert certainly, as I said, because Krishna himself authorizes and Om Apavitra Pavitrova Sarvavastam Gatotiva Yes Mare Pundari Kaksham Sabayapyatra Shuchihi. So whatever Krishna touches, that becomes pure, spiritualized. It's no more considered matter or material. You see, the beautiful deities of Jagannath, they're carved out of wood. So it doesn't mean that, oh, you know, he's wood anymore. He's Jagannath himself. The whole deity has become the Supreme Lord Krishna himself. So uh, certainly matter can be purified and spiritualized by these process, the authentic process that have been stated in the Shastras, in the scriptures. And Krishna and all the material elements have come from Krishna himself. Yeah. These are all eight, you know, starting from the five Panchabhutas and, you know, my intelligence, ego, they're all Bhinna prakriti, my separated energy, Krishna is saying. So there's not, everything is Krishna. Whether it is material or spiritual. It is depending on the way we how we uh, transport, I mean transform it, yeah, with our consciousness. That makes a difference. Yeah. The same thing that is food or uh, bhoga, when it is offered to the Lord, it becomes spiritualized or sanctified food, and it is called prasadam. So anything that is used in the service of the Lord becomes sanctified, purified, or spiritualized. So that's how uh, it is not, it's no longer impure, even though the Lord is manifesting himself in the material elements. <clears throat> so going ahead. So this is what is uh, written in the, the Sri Vaishnava Agamas. Sri Ramanuja Acharya explains that there are five-fold manifestations of God. What are these five-fold manifestations of God? They are Para, Vyuha, Vibhava, Antaryami, and Archa. These are the five manifestations. Para, what is Para? Para is the original Bhagwan form of the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead situated in his spiritual abode. That is the Bhagwan feature of the Lord, Krishna. Then there is the Vyuha feature. What is the Vyuha feature? The first, the quadruple expansion, the Supreme Lord. He divides himself into four, the Vasudeva feature, Aniruddha, Pradyumna, <clears throat> Sankarshana. So Vasudeva, Sankarshana, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha, four quadruple expansions, Chatur Vyuha. So this is a, this is a Vyuha expansion, Vyuha manifestation of God. The third is the Vibhava. The Vibhava are the ten Dashavataras. So we know all these avatars of the Supreme Lord, the Narsimha Avatara, Vamana, and Parashurama, Buddha, Matsya, Purma, all these avatars, all these dash avatars, it's, this, all these come under the Vibhava. And fourth is the Antaryami form. So Antaryami, Antaryami is a super soul form of the Lord, yeah, who is situated in each of our, of our hearts as the Paramatma. That's Antaryami manifestation. And the fifth is Archa. So Archa is the Lord in his deity form. So these are the five-fold manifestations of God. So now I have a question for all of you here. What is the difference between the first four and the fifth? Difference between para, vyuha, vibhava, antaryami and archa. What's the difference between the first four and the fifth one? Accessibility, Mataji. Accessibility, uh, can you be more clear? That is, uh, Bhagavan Krishna is not accessible. Krishna in his Bhagavan feature, he's not accessible. If you pray, you pray to him, right? Sometimes in our deepest of crisis, we pray. Yes, Mataji. He's accessible. Yeah. So? First four, we cannot see, but fifth one, we can see and we can render service. Yeah, exactly. The fifth one is tangible and visible to our gross material senses. The first four are not visible or did, did any of us see the super soul within? I, I mean, until now I haven't seen. <laughs> yeah. 
scriptures say dhyana avasthena tadatena manasa pashyantiyam yogino in the deepest of meditation great yogis see dhyana avastha yeah in his in the deepest processes of their heart they have the darshan of the super soul of parmatma that's a very advanced stage of yogis bhagwan to means oh, it happens to very great prayer souls pure devotees so uh para vyuha the wonderful expansion you know we we have to uh, we get the darshan once we are back in the spiritual world so all these first four para vyuha vibhava and uh, <clears throat> antaryami they are all spiritual forms not visible or tangible to our material senses but archa archa is one form one manifestation of god that is accessible to our these gross material senses we can see the lord yeah we can with our eyes we can touch the lord with our hands yeah and serve him with these own gross senses we can walk up to the temple with our legs and do such beautiful services make some nice garlands with our hands yeah and just take darshan with his eyes and just drink the nectar of the beauty of the lord incessantly with his eyes it is said you know there are beautiful beautiful verses that speak about each of the limb and each part of uh, krishna's beautiful body it is said if we simply meditate on the beautiful eyebrows of krishna all the lust in the heart disappears yeah i mean i really miss going to the temple now seeing all this but the meditation on the beautiful form of the deity is something that is so amazing it's so absorbing and it's so liberating it is a beautiful um, song a uh, verse by mukundamala by king pula shekhar alwar <clears throat> i'll i'll tell about that later fine yeah so that is the difference between archa and the remaining four types so <clears throat> this is a beautiful verse of the chaitanya charitamrit madhya leela which speaks about this the five potent forms of devotional service sadhu sanga nama kirtana bhagavata shravana mathura vasa shri motira shraddhaya sevana sakala sadhana shreshta ei pancha anga krishna prema janmaya ei panchera alpa sanga these five limbs of devotional service are the best of all even a slight performance of these five awakens love for krishna that's how potent each of them are so <clears throat> next so basically as i said shri murti or uh, the vigraha the beautiful transcendental deity form of the lord is manifest in front of our eyes for us out of the mercy of the supreme lord if not krishna supreme lord is invisible in the first very first verse of uh, queen kunti prayers she sings namaste purusham padyam ishvare prakrite param alakshyam sarvabhutanam antar bahi vyavasthitam ஆதிபுருஷ and your prakrite param you are beyond the matter so and there is something called maya jhavani jhavani means curtain maya jhavani means a curtain made of maya is just blocking our vision to see you so uh, so this is what is krishna he is alakshyam sarvabhutanam he is invisible to all our material eyes material faculties but yet he makes himself visible and accessible to us out of his causeless mercy in the form of archa vigraha yeah the dt form so it is for us to take advantage and serve and express our gratitude by rendering service so dt worship is not uh, it's a 
generally and people have a tendency to think it's something for the neophytes sentimentalists and uh, not very advanced but if you see the history of the entire vaishnava sampradaya the greatest of acharyas have spent their lives their hearts and souls in worshiping the deities with their very life the great adi shankara acharya he is worshiped the beautiful deities at badri vishal his favorite deity is the deity of lord narsingha dev yeah and his whole life he is spent in worshiping this beautiful deity he composed so many beautiful prayers of the bhaja govindam expressing his very ardent devotion to govinda bhaja govindam bhaja govindam govindam bhaja mudamati so this is adi shankar acharya through his example whatever acharyas do they are showing through their example for the rest of the people to follow and what has great adi shankar acharya uh, exemplified ardently worshiped the deity of krishna and composed so many beautiful forms of songs in glorification of the lord and when we see next great acharyas like shripad ramanuj acharya yeah after he has taken sanyas he spent all of his life in worshiping the beautiful deities of ranganath swami at rangakshetra called shri rangam yeah very beautiful deities this is so beautiful you have to just watch it two eyes are not sufficient and the great history for this deity the deity is worshiped of ranganath swami has been worshiped by lord brahma himself and later during during ram rama leela also it has been worshiped by dashrath maharaj and later vibhishana the great history to the deities and then adish uh, our uh, shri pad ramanuj acharya worshiped the deity of ranganath swami all his entire life i mean whatever preaching mission he had he fulfilled them outside the presence of shri rangakshetra and the rest of his entire life he spent in ardently worshiping the deity of ranganath swami so during his course of uh, uh, a there is one his famous disciple called dhanurdhar yeah you see in the picture dhanurdhar so this dhanurdhar he was a you know he he was so madly in love with a girl and because and he was so much in love with her that you know he couldn't take her eyes off her especially he was fascinated by her beautiful eyes and uh, he was so once there was a beautiful procession of ranganatha the deity of ranganatha swami in the rangakshetra so the etiquette is that whenever you see a deity you immediately offer obeisances and follow the procession as much as long as you can like all of you have witnessed the jagannath rath yatra right so whenever you see the deity the immediate etiquette is wherever you are irrespective on the road or mud or anything just offer your obeisances and then follow the procession with the devotees to some at least to however long it possible that's the etiquette so this person dhanurdhar he seen rangana i mean he didn't even see <laughs> lord ranganath coming out because here he was holding an umbrella over the head of this beautiful girl with whom he was in love and he didn't want the harsh sun rays to come and scorch the beauty of his beloved and just staring at her eyes you know they and she was looking into his eyes and they both were just fixed in a trance and they were so oblivious of what's happening around so this was dhanurdas so ramanuj acharya was just passing by and he seen dhanurdas and when he saw them like everybody felt it was awkward but ramanuj acharya felt compassionate this is acharya this is acharya's vision yeah they're not judgmental it's only compassion that flows out of their heart so he approaches dhanurdas and he asks my dear child and he was not willing to listen but he had to distract him he says uh the lord's procession is going on but how come you are just simply staring at your uh, at the eyes of another lady then he was slightly distracted but in a moment he took a moment to get back to ramanuj acharya and he said these are the most beautiful things that i have ever seen i have seen nothing more beautiful than the eyes of my beloved then ramanuj acharya said if i show you something more beautiful will you agree that you will uh, worship them and dhanurdas said of course and of course not they can't be anything more beautiful than the eyes of my beloved then he says okay i will show you now so ramanuj acharya takes him to the eternal deity hall 
the garbha sanctum sanctorum and i mean all of us have taken darshan of deities many times it's not that the moment we see we fell in love and we lost all taste for material desires because to actually have the darshan of the lord in the deity form it requires special eyes preman jana churita bhakti vilochanena the eyes should be anointed with the love of god to actually have the darshan of the real form of the lord in the deity too so what did ramanuj acharya do here he prayed to ranganath swami my dear lord ranganath you are all beautiful all merciful kindly reveal your infinite oceanic beauty to the eyes of dhanurdar dhanurdas so when he prayed that way to ranganath swami ranganath swami because he hears he hears every prayer of his pure devotee and he obliges by them he manifests his true beauty to the eyes of dhanurdas so immediately dhanurdas when he takes darshan of ranganath's eyes he got into a mind blowing spiritual trance and he couldn't handle it he was totally flat because he actually saw the beauty of lord ranganath's eyes so at that moment he dedicated his life his heart and soul to the worship and to the service of lord ranganath and eventually he married the uh, the girl whom he was following in he was in with whom he was in love with and both of them together became disciples of uh, ramanuja acharya and eventually they have also worshiped the deity of ranganath swami together so this is the process the the process is by the mercy of the spiritual master one will be able to realize the true identity of the deity so initially in the kanishta platform what we see is just the cross that we have to sincerely worship with whatever devotion we have and eventually the deity will reveal its identity to us <clears throat> by the mercy of the spiritual master so this is the story of our great ramanuja acharya and how he spent his entire life in worshiping the great deity of ranganath swami and here we have also madhva acharya the great acharya who was worshiped udipi krishna yeah madhva acharya was he was so famous if you see in this picture madhva acharya he's he's with two fingers like this what does it represent the dvaita philosophy he is a very strong proponent of dvaita philosophy yeah that is lord, the, the supreme lord and the jiva are two different entities that's dvaita philosophy and they are very famous for his great scholarliness erudition and he could defeat any mayavad philosophy and just break them into pieces very very strong in his uh, arguments yeah and all the philosophical treatises so um, so as i said and advacharya is famous for that and he is none other than the vayuputra you know he is the incarnation of vayuputra bhima yeah he is the incarnation of bhima so uh, and but what is he famous for he is famous for his worship of the beautiful deity of udipi krishna so he actually found this uh, beautiful deity of udipi krishna in a very uh, beautiful way the one day he was at the bank i mean at the uh, beach you know near the ocean and there was a huge ship that was coming and uh, you know no uh, it was almost about to wreck but he has helped the ship to not wreck and so the person in charge of the ship with gratitude he came out and he said i want i owe you a lot you have saved my ship from wrecking please take anything that you want then uh, madhvacharya said i don't need anything okay if you just have gopi chandan give me gopi chandan i'll put the luck with that then he said i've got blocks of gopi chandan please go and take so uh, madhvacharya uh, ascends the ship and there he finds a big block of gopi chandan so he picks it up it was so heavy so as soon as he picked up that gopi chandan broke open and from that came the beautiful deity of udipi krishna and if any of you have visited udipi deity form is so so beautiful so enchanting it's a form of krishna as a cowherd boy and he was holding a stick and uh, makhan and this actually this deity had a great history it's been uh, carved and worshiped by rukmini devi herself because uh, she is the queen of dwaraka and uh, she wanted to she never witnessed the past times of krishna and vrindavan so she had a strong desire to see krishna in his cowherd boy form so that's how this deity manifested and this deity worshiped by rukmini devi herself so that's how uh, so 
that's the greatness of the deity of uh, Rupi Krishna. So Madhvacharya has taken the next next slide. Yeah, that's how Madhvacharya took the deity form of Rupi Krishna. And uh, nobody could, even 20, 40 people could not carry the deity. But Madhvacharya with his two hands, two loving hands, carried the deity and installed it in the place where he stands right now and worshipped him. And he established such high standards of deity worship. You know, for Madhvas, actually, their sadhana itself is their deity worship. Like how we all do our chanting, for them, their sadhana itself is deity worship. The highest, if you see the mats, the Udupi mats, it has different mats. And they take turns, you know, of eight years, each mat. And in each mat, there's a Mataripadi, the highest, the sannyasi, like our Pejavar Swami. In Pejavar mat, recently, our Swamiji has left his body, Krishna Swami. So, the highest cadre sannyasi, they worship the deity. Yeah, the highest standards of purity. Oh my God, you can't even imagine. Like if you ever visit Udupi, you can see that. And they perform the artis, the bhogas and everything. And all these standards are established by our great Madhavacharya. So, and uh, here, and also we see our, in the Sampradaya, uh, our great Madhavendra Puri. He worshipped the deity of Gopalji in Vrindavan. So in Vrindavan, when he was uh, actually in chanting and when he was in a trance, uh, Krishna appeared in his dream and he said that, you know, I am there in this bushes, please pick me up and worship me. So in the bushes, he found this beautiful deity of Gopalji, whom he has uh, in, uh, installed on the Giri Govardhan. And there was a huge festival and all the Brajwasis came and cooked amazing offerings and did the Abhishek. So once this Gopalji, yeah, this is what you see in the picture. Yeah, and they offered beautiful, amazing offerings. Chappan Bok to this Gopalji deity. And this is where, uh, and uh, one day when Madhvendra, Madhvendra Puri was asleep, Gopalji appeared in his dream again and he said, you see, it's very hot here. I want the Malai Chandan, which you find near the Jagannath Puri. So Madhavendra Puri woke up and immediately next day he set out all the way to Jagannath Puri and crossing through so many jungles and risking his life to actually, you know, fetch that Malay Chandan. And on his way back, he had to take rest at a place. And he appeared again in his dream and said, you see, Madhavendra Puri, uh, you know, on your way back at a place called Remuna near Jagannath Puri, I am myself manifest in the form of Gopinath. So you go there and give the Malai Chandan there. So uh, Madhavendra Puri goes to Remuna and he offers the beautiful Malai Chandan to the deity of Gopinath. And there's a beautiful pastime of Kheer Chor, uh, like how he steals, uh, how Gopinath deities himself steals the Kheer, I mean the uh, Payasam to and puts it aside to give it to Madhavendra Puri. I'll tell you some other time. It takes a long time. So very beautiful pastimes are performed by Madhavendra Puri. There is a key to Gopinath. And uh, yeah, and uh, we see in our own uh, Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was, I mean, there is so many amazing pastimes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita and Chaitanya Bhagavat. How Mahaprabhu worshipped the deities. You know, Mahaprabhu uh, worshipped Govardhan Shila with his tears. He used to do the Abhishek with his tears of love. That was his standard of worship. And he used to often feel, just cry tears, just saying that I am not qualified to worship the deity form of the Lord. So this was his humility. He, this was his, you know, devotee heart. So Mahaprabhu, when uh, he went to Puri, on the way to Puri, he saw the uh, Sudarshan Chakra, and he just fainted, remembering the time of I have approached the uh, transcendental abode of the Lord. And when he went and took darshan of the deities of Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra, he again fainted in trance and ecstasy because what he had seen, the deity form as non different from Krishna himself, was so in love with the deities. And in fact, every day he used to come and take uh, darshan of Jagannath from a long distance. And he used to hold the Dvajastamba. And if you go even till date, this Dvajastamba has melted as, you know, out of the ecstatic love of Mahaprabhu. You know, with that warmth, the Dvajastamba has melted at some place. It has the fingerprints of Mahaprabhu still present. 
and you know during the period of snana yatra when the whole temple is closed for a few weeks mahaprabhu was unable to bear the separation of the lord so at that time uh, mahaprabhu used to visit a place called alarnath this is a few kilometers away from jagannathpuri it's a very beautiful place and uh, it's a beautiful deity of krishna in a different form it's called alarnath deity so every day he used to go to alarnath temple and he used to take darshan of the lord and in that ecstasy you know where he is mahaprabhu used to offer obeisances yeah that whole stone that stone melted and it has that imprint of the form of the lord it's still visible till date you now where his uh, entire transcendental body is offering the obeisances that stone has melted so every day he used to take darshan of alarnath deity and you know that's how he used to, and and Uh, you know and uh, even then mahaprabhu was so much in trance he used to faint in that ecstasy and all the devotees used to chant hari naam for him to again come to normal consciousness so the so deity worship is so beautifully a part of the uh, many pastimes of the supreme lord and the acharyas the greatest of acharyas have worshiped the deities so it's not something on a kanishta platform that somebody worships Yeah, but there is a difference in the way a Kanishta, a Madhyama, and Uttama Adhikari they see the deities. Yeah, how they uh, see and approach the deities are different. But it's a gradual progress. So initially, the Kanishta sees the deity only in that place, and he does not regard the others in the proper way. But later on, as the devotion matures forth, he sees the very same deity in the hearts of other people, other Vaishnavas. Okay, so this is how. I mean, and after Mahaprabhu, all the great acharyas like Sanatan Goswami has worshipped the beautiful forms of Radha Madan Mohan Ji, then Rupa Goswami has worshipped Radha Govind Ji, Madhu Pandit has worshipped the beautiful forms of Radha Gopinath Ji, then uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, the deities of Radha Ramana, and innumerable. And actually, I mean, I can just go on, but there is no time. I should start concluding. So this achinam is there for a beautiful process. At Shri La Prabhupada has himself, when he started the matchless gift store in the U.S. in the beginning of Krishna consciousness, the first thing that he used to start, he started with is the deity worships. Uh, and all the hippies used to gather just to see what's going on. They used to they used to call it the bell festival because you know Prabhupada used to ring the bell, so they didn't know what it was. <laughs> We used to call it bell ceremony, and uh, so all of them used to attend just to witness this bell ceremony and get gulab jamuns at the end of that session. So, and Prabhupada has installed, of course, all of us know so many one or eight temples and deities all over the world because it's the very heart of Krishna consciousness, deity worship. So, uh, and. All our uh, great acharya, I mean, our own in in our own line. These are the deities of Yamuna Mataji, Dada, Van Vihari. You see, Mataji, the way she dresses the deities with such devotion. If you see, her, read her book, her biography. Many of such beautiful pictures are there. In fact, even people who are atheists, when they came and took darshan of the deities and the altar, the way she used to maintain, they used to believe in the presence of God. <laughs> you know. because the kind of devotion that oozed out of her you know worship it was it it, it melted the rock like hearts of even atheists and they like, yes god must be present if not something like this cannot touch my heart so much so so that's the you know power of devotion it can really touch transform and melt hearts of even the most hard hearted atheists so i will just tell you some basics about how i mean Yeah, as a, these are the beautiful deities of Radha Gopi Janavala. They have a beautiful story. There is, uh, I'm just telling two minutes. Okay, it's already eight. <clears throat> so there is once. Uh, this is in the recent past, not very, uh, maybe a decade ago. Not sorry, not a decade, a century ago. Not even a century ago. Forty, fifty years. Forty, fifty years ago. This is what happened. So there's, there's a. This is the deity of Gansham Baba Ji. So this Gansham Baba, when he was a small child, he went to Rindavan along with his parents. So when he went to Rindavan, he fell in love with the place so much that he just told them that I'm not going to come back home. I will stay here only. 
And so his parents were shocked. What is this? He said, no, mommy, I'm not going to come back. Please, you leave. Just leave me here. And he meant it. And he left, and he just bid farewell to his parents and he never returned home. He stayed back in Vrindavan. So and as a small child. And then after that, he lived in Vrindavan. And every day, there used to be a place. And in that place, in the Braj Mitti, the sand of Vrindavan, he used to write the name Radha. Every day, he used to write the name Radha. And he used to worship the name itself as a deity. So he used to say, he used to write Radha, he used to worship, offer flowers and offer prayers and offer whatever offerings he could. Yeah, the beautiful flowers of Vrindavan. He used to worship that name, Nama Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasavigraha, Purna Shuddho Nitya Mukto, Abhinnatvam Nama Namini. Abhinnatvam Nama Namini. The Nama and Namini, the name and the form of the Lord are indifferent. They're one and the same. We speak about it, we recite it, but here is what somebody, a, a pure devotee doing it with faith. Yeah. So he wrote the name Radha and he worshipped the name as a deity. So as he was doing this on a regular basis, one day he was again writing and he felt something touch his hand, his fingers. And so he started digging that place. So when he was digging it deeper and deeper and deeper, so suddenly he came across these deity forms, these beautiful forms of Radha, Gopi, Janavala. You are seeing here, he found these deities there. So he excavated deities from that place. And from that day onwards, he gave his life, soul, everything in worshipping these beautiful forms of Radha, Gopi, Janavala. And if you read the book, My Journey Home of Maharaj, you know, there's such a beautiful story of how he used to consider himself the servant of these deities and whoever has come to him as the friend of Gopi Janavala. When Maharaj Radha Swami Maharaj went to visit this Babaji, he used to say, you know, he himself never used to have, I mean, when Maharaj used to sleep at his ashram, he never, he himself never used to have a rug to cover himself. It's, you know, in Vrindavan, it's so cold, it's biting cold. You know, you can't survive without wearing hand gloves. I have this experience when I went in December. It's really biting cold. It's very chill. So during that time, when Maharaj used to sleep some time in uh, the ashram of um, Ghanisham Babaji, he used to just give away, he used to have only one rug to cover himself. So he used to give that rug to Maharaj. He just keep it. You're the friend of Radha Gopi Janavala and I am his servant. And you should be treated nicely. So this was a mood in which he worshipped the deities. And uh, yes, and right now Babaji is no longer there. He's handed over the worship to some others, but they continue to remain and bestow their mercy and beautiful darshan to whoever visits. Okay, so yeah, yeah, coming to the practical aspect of uh, so yes, now I'm sure it's inspiring to each of us. And it's not something that is so far away that we cannot do it. We can start from where we are, beginning with setting up a small altar at our own home. Yeah. So today I will discuss with you some basics, something that we can do practically and uh, begin somewhere. <clears throat> and let me tell you, even worshipping the paintings of Radha Krishna, understanding them don't different from the deities themselves is equally potent as worshipping the Achavigrahas. It's just that matter of faith and devotion that one should have. So initially we can start with worshipping the paintings or the deity uh, pictures while setting up the altar. So firstly, step one, what we have to do in the process of deity worship, select a nice place. One should select an appropriate place where to place the altar. So the place is a place which was little, uh, where there's a little bit of privacy, where we can regularly go and offer our prayers and offer some worship and chant some rounds or read some books in front of the deities. So select a proper place. And which is not generally, uh, you know, in the place where we walk around or play around. So uh, in the earlier days, no, there used to be a separate uh, deity worship room outside the house and that's how they were taken care of. But now these days we do not have that facility. If you know, if you've seen some old houses, the kitchen is outside. The deity's uh, room is outside. Yeah, because it's a very uh, sanctified place. 
should not be touched just like that. But right now we cannot mimic that uh, kind of a situation in our current condition. But at least we should give a very clean and neat place for the BPs, which is uh, not perturbed by uh, random moving about of uh, residents of the house. And where we can have a peaceful time, you know, where we sit back, offer prayers and chant, etc. So selecting a nice, bright place is a step number one. I mean, if some of yours might be staying in hostels or uh, you have your own room, you can even select that place, yeah, a nice place. And step two is then uh, have an altar. If you can, in whatever way it is possible, you can have an altar or you can just set up your table. I remember when I used to go to SN Academy uh, in the 11th and 12th standard, they, set, they did set up a nice uh, table and they had their own altar. So, and there are some uh, uh, etiquettes that we need to observe. That is, you should have a three-step altar. In the most, in the lower rung, we uh, we have to keep the bona fide acharyas of the sampradaya. So this is the Brahma Madhva Gaudiya sampradaya that we are following. So we keep the uh, pictures of the acharyas, starting from Prabhupada, his guru Shila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur, his guru Shila Gaupti Shorbat Das Babaji Maharaj, his guru Shila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, his guru Shri Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj. <clears throat> so this is a guru parampara yeah and then uh, the shard goes from acharyas they have to be on the lower rung the next rung you keep the panchatattva and narsimha swami yeah and also if you have any uh, any other small deities or you, you keep rinda devi so it should be on the next level of narsimha dev and panchatattva and on topmost rung you keep the uh, painting or the picture of Radha Krishna. So this is how it should, the altar should be made. This is the etiquette of the altar. Yeah, two steps, the lower, the middle and the higher. It should not be mixed. So very important to observe this etiquette. So after setting up the altar, what you need to do, everybody can have this Achaman cup. You find this uh, anywhere outside. Especially, you can have actually two of these Achaman cups. One Achaman cup is for purifying your own self and another achaman cup is to purify the items that you're offering to the lord yeah and there is a small achaman mantra gange chayamane cheva and when you need to take water initially if you cannot chant the mantra just this copper vessel is sufficient to purify the water that you take in that yeah copper is very uh, considered pure it's a purifier of water if you don't if you cannot chant mantras just take water in this achaman cup it is in itself ready to purify the items that you're about to offer and purify your own self too. Yeah, so take two cups and Achaman mantras you can recite and make them and invite all the holy rivers into the Achaman path. And uh, sit by chanting Keshavayana, Keshavayana, Manarayana, Mahan, Govindayana, four things, four mantras and then Achaman and purify yourself and you're ready for worship. And then what are the two basic things that you have to do? Aarti and Bhoga offering. These two things I think you can manage. Initially, you can. there are seven items that are offered as uh, Aarti. These are all stated in the famous Hari Bhakti Vilas and uh, Narada Pancharatri Kavidis, how to offer Aartis. There is one conch that from, on, from which you blow and there's a small conch with which you offer water. So what you see here are five items. Incense, incense is not there. Yeah, there's incense, there is pancha pradipa, then there's water that you offer, and there's a uh, vastra, which is in the form of a handkerchief, and the fifth one is flowers that you offer. Apart from that, you offer chamar and uh, a peacock fan. So, what is this offering of arti actually? So, offering arti in a, is in an actuality a, a, a technicality, a ritualistic process, but behind that is a great science. It's a great science of offering our gratitude to the Lord. Yeah. So like, for example, the incense represents offering the element of earth. Yeah, the flowers, flowers represent offering the uh, element of earth and the chama represent offering the element of ether. Like that offering the pancha bhutas, the Lord. It's like, you know, every day we go to Ganga and we get into Ganga and we take the water from Ganges and offer it back into Ganges. Yeah? 
So it's like what all Krishna has given us, we are offering the same to the Lord plus our gratitude and devotion. Because in reality, what can what is it that we can give to the Lord? The Lord owns everything. He's the supreme proprietor of everything. So what is that that we can give? An offering of our gratitude and our love and devotion. So uh, that's what is the meaning of the RT. So each of these items represents the gross elements and the subtle elements. And when we are offering our, when we are offering arti while singing, we are offering our emotions to the Lord. When we are offering obeisances in front of the deities, we are offering our ego to the Lord. Yeah. And we are, when we are mindfully doing this arti, we are offering our consciousness, attention, our focus and our mind to the Lord. So everything, arti is such a beautiful process to begin our day with. When we begin our day with offering the arti to the Lord, it's such a synchronization of the body, mind and the soul in attunement to the superior self. So many people ask the question, right? Like, how do we mm, understand that whatever we are doing, we are doing it for Krishna? How do we know that, our, how do we do our regular duties of cooking or going to job or our own studies as an offering to Krishna? This is what happens when you begin your day with offering the arti. When you chant your rounds, when you offer the arti, then the body, mind, and the soul come into synchrony with that purpose of devotion to the Lord. And then whatever activities you do throughout the day will automatically become synchronized to perform it for the pleasure of the Lord. So that is why morning program is so important. Yeah, and then offering of bhoga, as I said, prepare nice sattvic items and purify whatever you have prepared with the achaman, path, achaman water and put one tulsi on each of the item. And there are some nice prasadam uh, bhoga offering prayers, which I can share and offer it for the pleasure of the Lord. These are the few things that you can do. Offering arti, offering bhoga, and sit in front of the Lord and chant some rounds, and sit in front of the Lord and sing some kirtans, bhajans, and read some scripture. So this is how you give pleasure to the deities. And few worship deities, there's something called the benefits of deity worship. They're enormous. Uh, well, benefits of deities, deity worship. Okay, so the benefits of rendering deity worship, they're unlimited and enormous. It is, uh, you know, the, otherwise the mind, which is so difficult to control and which is always engrossed in my material sound vibrations of, uh, you know, movie songs or material visions of television and televised shows and YouTube and whatnot. Our senses, gross and subtle, they're always engrossed in matter because of what we are surrounded with. But this deity worship is something, a great means to elevate our consciousness to that transcendental level. I mean, in my own experience, I will tell you, this is, it's the best part of the day and of our lives. I mean, I, I, I can personally tell you with experience how much our life has changed after deities have come into our own home. Home really became the like a temple. It was such an amazing experience. So this is the these are benefits of deity worship, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and one, and one more thing I can tell you for sure. If somebody asks me what's the best part of Krishna consciousness, I can tell you it's the daily routine. Just the daily routine of Krishna consciousness. It's so blissful. Just wake up, offer prayers to the Lord, chant, wake up the deities. Offer nice boga to the Lord and sit with all your family members and nice, nicely honor the prashadam. Offer nice arti to the Lord. It's it's such a beautiful, amazing process, way to start start a day. And after that, you go and do your work. It's so blissful. And then come back home and evening and sing more bhajans to the Lord and honor your dinner prashadam and sleep. Wow, what a day it is. So it it just they just fill your heart with such ecstasy, uh, you know, just to center our lives around the deity worship of the Lord. It's so beautiful. The very process is so uplifting, so amazing. And the festivals that you perform, is, they bring so much of delight to the inmates of the house. 
and they give so many blessings so much of so merciful and they just fill your heart with love and it is like just like you know sometimes you take a tiffin box and uh, you make nice items and you give your neighbors and they return it back with some more uh, nice things added to it right it's a common custom you give them something in a box they give it back to you with uh, more items sometimes it's a surprise to open and see what they have given so similarly whatever bhoga you offer to the lord krishna he accepts it and he gives you back and what does he give you back that surprise that what he gives you back is his love for you krishna prem which is so hard so difficult to access it's just gifted to you by krishna when you offer him with love the bhoga whatever you're offering so these are the benefits of bt worship some headings so it's a good engagement for the gross body it purifies our existence dt worship means purify 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 see the very fact that you're doing achaman before you go to the supreme lord indicates you cannot approach krishna without yourself being pure yeah to render dt worship first of all it purifies our own existence so much the number of baths you take in a day should be at least thrice a day okay that's for a uh, high standard of dt worship but generally so it purifies our existence purifies a gross body relieves from sense agitation so much of sense agitation is simply reduced uh, this is a quote by uh, go back uh, prabhupad if one simply deposits all of his or her loving propensity into onto the deity of krishna immediately they are relieved of anxiety due to material sense agitation so uh, if you're ever feeling agitated go to the temple just make nice flower garlands for krishna see the difference it gives constant remembrance of the lord yeah it's by default you know because there are certain timings that you have to uh, stick to you, to wake up the lord or you put the deities to rest or make some offerings of a water and all that you get to see the lord so many times and offer obeisances you know in the process you accumulate so much not just sukruti but you know a deep relationship with the lord himself so it's a constant remembrance it's the easiest way to remember krishna i can tell you and enables one to go back to godhead yeah it provides an opportunity to touch the body of supreme personality of god it enables us one to be fortunate enough to get a spiritual body and go back to godhead it's such an amazing experience to you know bathe the lord and dress him and decorate him especially offer flower garlands to him best part of life yeah and another uh, benefit is it, it leads imperceptibly to liberation just do all these angas this little little seva to the deity and just without knowing itself one ascends the path of liberation eventually gets liberated such a powerful process okay so here it's written even a third class devotee that means kanishtha adhikari who is not advanced in knowledge sees the lord in the temple simply offers obeisances with great devotion thinks of the lord brings forth flowers and fruits to offer to the deity becomes imperceptibly liberated yeah without knowing they simply become liberated just by doing the simple things go to the deity take some nice flowers and fruits with you offer them to the lord offer nice prayers to the lord just do this constantly regularly as much as you can and that's it you're liberated <sighs> that's how powerful the deity worship is and how sweet and beautiful it is so these benefits are unlimited and of course there are also offenses to be avoided but that probably i will just share it with you there's a list of offenses to be avoided in front while rendering deity worship i can share that with you <clears throat> okay so thank you all very much i will end here because i have to it's been a pleasure to share whatever little i have learned have experienced and uh, and following in my little way thank you all very much any question at this point hari bol thank you shravya thank you everyone for joining i mean i i also see a lot of enthusiastic new students who have come today i don't know if someone is new you can introduce yourself if you wish to okay fine so thank you all very much so next week we will all meet for the next session which is hari bol thank you all thank you uh next session is about the 
chanting Japa reform, how we can improve our Japa and many uh, wonderful details of the ecstasy of chanting the holy name. So that we're going to discuss in the next session. Yes, thank you all very much for your attentive hearing and participation. If you want to know further details, you all can message me in the group. Yeah, thank you, Kavya. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Yes, Bhargavi. It's Bhargavi. Who is Bhargavi? Hare Krishna, Shreya, Gandavad. Yes.